In the beginning was the Logos, the Big Bang, the primordial Ohm. Big Bang theory says that the physical universe spiraled out of an unimaginably hot and dense single point called a singularity, billions of times smaller than the head of a pin. It does not say why or how. The more mysterious something is, the more we take for granted that we understand it. It was thought that eventually gravity would either slow the expansion or contract the universe in a big crunch. However, images from the Hubble Space Telescope show that the universe's expansion seems to be actually accelerating, expanding faster and faster as it grows out of the Big Bang. Somehow, there is more mass in the universe than physics predicted. To account for the missing mass, physicists now say that the universe consists of only 4% atomic matter, or what we consider normal matter. 23% of the universe is dark matter, and 73% is dark energy, what we previously thought of as empty space. It is like an invisible nervous system that runs throughout the universe connecting all things. The ancient Vedic teachers taught Nada Brahma, the universe is vibration. The vibratory field is at the root of all true spiritual experience and scientific investigation. It is the same field of energy that saints, Buddhas, yogis, mystics, priests, shamans, and seers have observed by looking within themselves. It has been called Akasha, the primordial Om, Indra's net of jewels, the music of the spheres, and a thousand other names throughout history. It is the common root of all religions. And the link between our inner worlds and our outer worlds. In Mahayana Buddhism in the third century, they described a cosmology not unlike the most advanced physics of modern day. Indra's net of jewels is a metaphor used to describe a much older Vedic teaching, which illustrates the way the fabric of the universe is woven together. Indra, the king of the gods, gave birth to the sun and moves the winds and the waters. Imagine a spider web that extends into all dimensions. The web is made up of dewdrops, and every drop contains the reflection of all the other water drops. And in each reflected dewdrop, you will find the reflections of all the other droplets, the entire web in that reflection, and so on to infinity. Indra's web could be described as a holographic universe where even the smallest stream of light contains the complete pattern of the whole. The Serbian-American scientist Nikolai Tesla is sometimes referred to as the man who invented the 20th century. Tesla was responsible for discovering alternating current electricity and many other creations that are now part of everyday life. Because of his interest in the ancient Vedic traditions, Tesla was in a unique position to understand science through both an Eastern and Western model. Like all great scientists, Tesla looked deeply into the mysteries of the outer world, but he also looked deeply within himself. 
Like the ancient yogis, Tesla used the term akasha to describe the etheric field that extends throughout all things. Tesla studied with Swami Vivekananda, a yogi who brought the ancient teachings of India to the West. In the Vedic teachings, akasha is space itself, the space that the other elements fill, which exists simultaneously with vibration. The two are inseparable. Akasha is yin to prana's yang. A modern concept that can help us to conceptualize akasha, or the primary substance, is the idea of fractals. It wasn't until the 1980s that advances in computers allowed us to actually visualize and reproduce mathematically the patterns in nature. The term fractal was coined in 1980 by mathematician Benoit Mandelbrot, who studied certain simple mathematical equations that when they are repeated, produce an unending array of changing mathematical or geometrical forms within a limited framework. They are limited, but at the same time, infinite. A fractal is a rough geometric shape that can be split into parts, each of which is at least approximately a reduced size copy of the whole pattern, a property called self-similarity. Mandelbrot's fractals have been called the thumbprint of God. You are seeing artwork generated by nature itself. If you turn the Mandelbrot figure a certain way, it looks sort of like a Hindu deity or Buddha. This figure has been termed the Buddha Bro figure. If you look at some forms of ancient art and architecture, you will see that humans have long associated beauty and the sacred with fractal patterns. Infinitely complex, yet every part contains the seed to recreate the whole. Fractals have changed mathematicians' views of the universe and how it operates. With each new level of magnification, there are differences from the original. Constant change and transformation occurs as we traverse from one level of fractal detail to another. This transformation is the cosmic spiral, the embedded intelligence of the matrix of time-space. Fractals are inherently chaotic, full of noise and order. When our minds recognize or define a pattern, we focus on it, as if it is a thing. We try to find the patterns we see as beautiful, but in order to hold the pattern in our minds, we must push away the rest of the fractal. To comprehend a fractal with the senses is to limit its movement. All energy in the universe is neutral, timeless, dimensionless. Our own creativity and capacity for pattern recognition is the link between the microcosm and macrocosm, the timeless world of waves, 
and the solid world of things. Observation is an act of creation through limitations inherent in thinking. We are creating the illusion of solidity, of things by labeling, by naming. The philosopher Kierkegaard said, if you name me, you negate me. By giving me a name, a label, you negate all of the other things I could possibly be. You lock the particle into being a thing by pinning it down, naming it. But at the same time, you are creating it, defining it to exist. Creativity is our highest nature. With the creation of things comes time, which is what creates the illusion of solidity. Einstein was the first scientist to realize that what we think of as empty space is not nothing. It has properties. And intrinsic to the nature of space is nearly unfathomable amounts of energy. The renowned physicist Richard Feynman once said, there is enough energy in a single cubic meter of space to boil all the oceans in the world. Advanced meditators know that in the stillness lies the greatest power. The Buddha had yet another term for the primary substance, what he termed kalapas, which are like tiny particles or wavelets that are arising and passing away trillions of times per second. Reality is, in this sense, like a series of frames in a holographic film camera, moving quickly so as to create the illusion of continuity. When consciousness becomes perfectly still, the illusion is understood because it is consciousness itself that drives the illusion. In the ancient traditions of the East, it has been understood for thousands of years that all is vibration. Nada Brahma, the universe is sound. The word Nada means sound or vibration, and Brahma is the name for God. Brahma simultaneously is the universe and is the creator. The artist and the art are inseparable. In the Upanishads, one of the oldest human records from ancient India, it is said, Brahma the Creator, sitting on a lotus, opens his eyes, and a world comes into being. Brahma closes his eyes, and a world goes out of being. Ancient mystics, yogis, and seers have maintained that there is a field at the root level of consciousness. The Akashic field, or the Akashic records, where all information, all experience, past, present, and future, exists now and always. It is this field or matrix from which all things arise, from subatomic particles to galaxies, stars, planets, and all life. You never see anything in its totality because it is made up of layer upon layer of vibration and it is constantly changing, exchanging information with Akasha. A tree is drinking in the sun, the air, the rain, the earth. 
A world of energy moves in and out of this thing we call a tree. When the thinking mind is still, then you see reality as it is, all aspects together. The tree and the sky and the earth, the rain and the stars are not separate. Life and death, self and other, are not separate. Just as the mountain and the valley are inseparable. In the Native American and other indigenous traditions, it is said that everything has spirit, which is simply another way of saying everything is connected to the one vibratory source. There is one consciousness, one field, one force that moves through all. This field is not happening around you. It is happening through you and happening as you. You are the you in universe. You are the eyes through which creation sees itself. When you wake from a dream, you realize that everything in the dream was you. You were creating it. So-called real life is no different. Everyone, everything is you. The one consciousness looking out of every eye. Under every rock. Within every particle. International researchers at CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics, are searching for this field that extends throughout all things. But instead of looking within, they look to the outer physical world. Researchers at the CERN Laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland, announced that they had found the Higgs boson, or the God particle. The Higgs boson experiments prove scientifically that an invisible energy field fills the vacuum of space. CERN's Large Hadron Collider consists of a ring 17 miles in circumference, in which two beams of particles race in opposite directions, converging and smashing together at nearly the speed of light. Scientists observe what comes out of the violent collisions. The standard model cannot account for how particles get their mass. Everything appears to be made of vibration, but there is no thing being vibrated. It is as if there has been an invisible dancer, a shadow, dancing hidden in the ballet of the universe. All the other dancers have always danced around this hidden dancer. We have observed the choreography of the dance, but until now we could not see that dancer. The so-called God particle, the properties of the base material of universe, the heart of all matter which would account for the unexplained mass and energy that drives the universe's expansion. But far from explaining the nature of the universe, the discovery of the Higgs boson simply presents an even greater mystery, revealing a universe that is more mysterious than we ever imagined. Science is approaching the threshold between consciousness and matter. The eye with which we look at the primordial field and the eye with which the field looks at us are one and the same. The German writer and luminary Wolfgang von Goethe said, the wave is the primordial phenomenon which gave rise to the world. Cymatics is the study of visible sound. The word cymatics comes from the Greek root cyma, which means wave or vibration. One of the first Western scientists to seriously study wave phenomena was Ernst Kladny 
a German musician and physicist who lived in the 18th century. Kladny discovered that when he spread sand on metal plates and then vibrated the plates with a violin bow, the sand arranged itself into patterns. Different geometrical forms appear depending on the vibration produced. Kladny recorded an entire catalog of these shapes, and they are referred to as Kladny figures. Many of these patterns can be found throughout the natural world, such as the markings of the tortoise, or the spot patterns of a leopard. Studying Kladni patterns or cymatic patterns is one secret way in which high-end guitar, violin, and other instrument makers determine the sound qualities of the instruments they make. Hans Jenny expanded on Kladni's work in the 1960s. Using various fluids and electronic amplification to generate sound frequencies, and coined the term cymatics. If you run simple sine waves through a dish of water, you can see patterns in the water. Depending on the frequency of the wave, different ripple patterns will appear. The higher the frequency, the more complex the pattern. These forms are repeatable, not random. The more you observe, the more you start to see how vibration arranges matter into complex forms from simple repeating waves. This water vibration has a pattern similar to a sunflower. Simply by changing the sound frequency, we get a different pattern. Water is a very mysterious substance. It is highly impressionable. That is, it can receive and hold on to vibration. Because of its high resonance capacity and sensitivity, and an inner readiness to resonate, the water responds instantaneously to all types of sonic waves. Vibrating water and earth make up the majority of mass in plants and animals. It is easy to observe how simple vibrations in water can create recognizable natural patterns. But as we add solids, and increase the amplitude, things get even more interesting. Adding cornstarch to water, we get more complex phenomena. Perhaps the principles of life itself can be observed as vibrations move the cornstarch blob into what appears to be a moving organism. The animating principle of the universe is described in every major religion using words that reflect the understanding of that time in history. In the language of the Incas, the largest empire in pre-Columbian America. The word for human body is Alpa Kamaska, which means literally animated earth. In Kabbalah, or Jewish mysticism, they talk about the divine name of God, the name that cannot be spoken. It cannot be spoken because it is a vibration that is everywhere. It is all words, all matter. Everything is the sacred word. The tetrahedron is the simplest shape that can exist in three dimensions. Something must have at least four points to have physical reality. The triangle structure is nature's only self-stabilizing pattern. 
In the Old Testament, the word tetragrammaton was often used to represent a certain manifestation of God. It was used when talking about the Word of God or the special name of God, Logos or Primordial Word. The ancient civilizations knew that at the root structure of the universe was the tetrahedral shape. Out of this shape, nature exhibits a fundamental drive toward equilibrium, Shiva, while it also has a fundamental drive towards change, Shakti. In the Bible, the Gospel of John usually reads, in the beginning was the word, but in the original text, the term used was logos. The Greek philosopher Heraclitus, who lived around 500 years before Christ, referred to the logos as something fundamentally unknowable, the origin of all repetition, pattern and form. The Stoic philosophers who followed the teachings of Heraclitus identified the term with the divine animating principle pervading the universe. In Sufism, the Logos is everywhere and in all things. It is that out of which the unmanifest becomes manifest. In the Hindu tradition, Shiva Nataraja literally means Lord of the Dance. The whole cosmos dances to Shiva's drum. All is imbued or ensouled with the pulsation. Only as long as Shiva is dancing can the world continue to evolve and change. Otherwise, it collapses back into nothingness. While Shiva is representative of our witnessing consciousness, Shakti is the substance or stuff of the world. While Shiva lies in meditation, Shakti tries to move him, to bring him into the dance. Like yin and yang, the dancer and the dance exist as one. Logos also means unconcealed truth. He who knows the Logos knows the truth. Many layers of concealment exist in the human world, as Akasha has been swirled into complex structures, concealing the source from itself, like a divine game of hide and seek. We have been hiding for thousands of years, eventually forgetting about the game completely. We somehow forgot that there was anything to find. In Buddhism, one is taught to directly perceive the Logos, the field of change or impermanence within oneself through meditation. When you observe your inner world, you observe subtler and subtler sensations and energies as the mind becomes more concentrated and focused. Through the direct realization of anicca or impermanence at the root level of sensation, one becomes free of attachment to transient external forms. Once we realize there is one vibratory field that is the common root of all religions, how can we say my religion or this is my primordial ohm, my quantum field? The true crisis in our world is not social, political or economic. Our crisis is a crisis of consciousness, an inability to directly experience our true nature, an inability to recognize this nature in everyone and in all things. In the Buddhist tradition, the Bodhisattva is a person with an awakened Buddha nature. A Bodhisattva vows to help to awaken every being in the universe, realizing that there is only one consciousness. To awaken one's true self, one must awaken all beings.
There are innumerable sentient beings in the universe. I vow to help them all to awaken. My imperfections are inexhaustible. I vow to overcome them all. The Dharma is unknowable. I vow to know it. The way of awakening is unattainable. I vow to attain it. The Pythagorean philosopher Plato hinted enigmatically that there was a golden key that unified all of the mysteries of the universe. It is this golden key that we will return to time and again throughout our exploration. The golden key is the intelligence of the Logos, the source of the primordial Om. One could say that it is the mind of God. With our limited senses, we are observing only the outer manifestation of the hidden mechanics of self-similarity. The source of this divine symmetry is the greatest mystery of our existence. Many of history's monumental thinkers such as Pythagoras, Kepler, Leonardo da Vinci, Tesla, and Einstein have come to the threshold of the mystery. Einstein said, the most beautiful thing we can experience is the mysterious. It is the source of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead. His eyes are closed. We are in the position of a little child entering a huge library filled with books in many different languages. The child knows someone must have written those books. It does not know how. It does not understand the languages in which they are written. The child dimly suspects a mysterious order in the arrangement of the books, but doesn't know what it is. That, it seems to me, is the attitude of even the most intelligent human being toward God. We see a universe marvelously arranged in obeying certain laws. Our limited minds cannot grasp the mysterious force that moves the constellations. Every scientist who looks deeply into the universe and every mystic who looks deeply within the self eventually comes face to face with the same thing. The primordial spiral. A thousand years before the creation of the ancient observatory at Stonehenge, the spiral was a predominant symbol on Earth. Ancient spirals can be found in all parts of the globe. Thousands of ancient spirals such as these can be found all over Europe, North American New Mexico, Utah, Australia, China, Russia, virtually every indigenous culture on Earth. The ancient spirals symbolize growth, expansion, and cosmic energy embodied within the sun and the heavens. The spiral form is mirroring the macrocosm of the unfolding universe itself. In native traditions, the spiral was the energetic source, the primordial mother. The Neolithic spirals at Newgrange, Ireland date back 5,000 years. They are 500 years older than the Great Pyramid of Giza, and they are just as enigmatic to modern observers. The spiral goes back to a time in history when humans were more connected to the Earth, 
to the cycles and spirals of nature, a time when humans were less identified with thoughts. The spiral is what we perceive to be the torque of the universe. Prana, or creative force, swirls akasha into a continuum of solid forms. Found at all levels between the macrocosm and the microcosm, from spiral galaxies to weather systems, to the water in your bathtub, to your DNA, to the direct experience of your own energy. The primordial spiral is not an idea, but rather that which makes all conditions and ideas possible. Various types of spirals and helices are found throughout the natural world. Snails. Sea coral. spider webs, fossils, seahorses' tails, and shells. Many spirals appearing in nature are observable as logarithmic spirals or growth spirals. As you move out from the center, the spiral sections get exponentially larger. Like Indra's net of jewels, logarithmic spirals are self-similar or holographic such that the characteristics of every part are reflected in the whole. 2,400 years ago in ancient Greece, Plato considered continuous geometric proportion to be the most profound cosmic bond. The golden ratio or divine proportion was nature's greatest secret. The golden ratio can be expressed as the ratio of A plus B to A is the same as the ratio of A to B. To Plato, the world soul binds together into one harmonic resonance. The same pentagonal pattern that exists in a starfish or in a slice of okra can be seen in the path of the planet Venus, traced in the night sky over an eight year period. intelligible world of forms above and the visible world of material objects below through this principle of geometric self-similarity. From the self-similar spiral patterns of the Romanesco broccoli to the arms of galaxies, logarithmic spirals are a ubiquitous and archetypal pattern. Our own Milky Way galaxy has several spiral arms which are logarithmic spirals with a pitch of about 12 degrees. The greater the pitch of the spiral, the tighter the turns. When you observe a plant growing in time-lapse video, you witness it dancing with the spiral of life. A golden spiral is a logarithmic spiral that grows outward by a factor of the golden ratio. The golden ratio is a special mathematical relationship that pops up over and over in nature. 
The pattern that is observable follows what is called the Fibonacci series or Fibonacci sequence. The Fibonacci series unfolds such that each number is the sum of the previous two numbers. The German mathematician and astronomer Kepler discovered that self-similar spiral patterns are observable in the way leaves are arranged on stems of plants or in the floret and petal arrangements of flowers. Leonardo da Vinci observed that the spacing of leaves was often in spiral patterns. These patterns are called phyllotaxis patterns or leaf arrangement patterns. Phyllotaxis arrangements can be seen in self-organizing DNA nucleotides. and in everything from the family trees of reproducing rabbits to pine cones, cacti, to snowflakes and in simple organisms such as diatoms. Diatoms are one of the most common types of phytoplankton, single-celled organisms that provide food for countless species throughout the food chain. How much math do you need to know to be a sunflower or a bee? Nature doesn't consult the physics department to grow broccoli. The structuring in nature happens automatically. Scientists in the field of nanotechnology use the term self-assembly to describe the way complexes are formed, such as in the initial hexagonal phase of DNA formation. In nanotechnology engineering, carbon nanotubes are comprised of a similar arrangement of materials. Nature does this type of geometry over and over, effortlessly, automatically, without a calculator. Nature is precise and extremely efficient. According to the famous architect and author Buckminster Fuller, these patterns are a function of time-space. DNA and honeycomb are the shape that they are for the same reason a bubble is round. It is the most efficient shape requiring the least amount of energy. Space itself has shape and allows only certain configurations for matter, always defaulting to what is most efficient. These patterns are the strongest and most efficient way to build architectural structures, such as geodesic domes. Logarithmic spiral patterns allow plants maximum exposure to insects for pollination. Maximum exposure to sunlight and rain and allow them to efficiently spiral water towards their roots. Birds of prey use the logarithmic spiral pattern to stalk their next meal. Flying in a spiral is the most efficient way to hunt. One's ability to see the spiral of life dancing akasha into material form is related to one's ability to see beauty and symmetry in nature. Poet William Blake said, the vegetative universe opens like a flower from the earth's center in which is eternity. It expands from stars to the mundane shell and there it meets eternity again, both within and without. The study of patterns in nature is not something that is very familiar in the West. But in ancient China, this science was known as Li. 
Li reflects the dynamic order and pattern in nature. But it is not pattern thought of as something static, frozen or unchanging, like a mosaic. It is dynamic pattern as embodied in all living things. The arteries of leaves, the markings of the tortoise and the vein patterns on rocks are all expressions of nature's secret language and art. The labyrinth is one of many Lee patterns. It is found in coral structures, mushrooms like the morel, cabbages, and in the human brain. The cellular pattern is another common form in nature. There are a myriad of different cellular structures, but all have a similar orderliness defined by their purpose and function. It is easy to be mesmerized with a constant play of forms. But what is most interesting is that certain archetypal forms seem to be woven into the fabric of nature at all. The branching pattern is another Lee pattern, or archetypal pattern, that is observable at all levels and all fractal scales. Take for example this incredible image of a supercomputer simulation known as the Millennium Run, showing the distribution of dark matter in the local universe. It was created by the Max Planck Society in Germany. Dark matter is essentially what we previously thought of as empty space. It is like an invisible nervous system that runs throughout the universe. The universe is literally like a giant brain. It is constantly thinking, using a type of dark or hidden energy that science is only starting to understand. Through this immense network, unfathomable energy moves, providing the momentum for the expansion and growth of the universe. Nature creates branching patterns automatically when we set up the right conditions. Nature is an art generating machine or a beauty creating engine. Here, electricity is being used to grow silver crystal branches. The footage is time lapsed as they grow over several hours. The crystals form on the aluminum cathode as ions are electrodeposited from a silver nitrate solution. The formation is self-organizing. You are seeing artwork generated by nature itself. Johann Wolfgang von Goethe said, beauty is a manifestation of secret natural laws, which otherwise would have been hidden from us forever. In this sense, everything in nature is alive, self-organizing. When higher voltage is used, the fractal branching becomes even more obvious. This is happening in real time.
In the human body, tree-like structures and patterns are found throughout. There are, of course, the nervous systems that Western medicine knows about. But in Chinese, Ayurvedic, and Tibetan medicine, the energy meridians are a central component to understanding how the body functions. The nadis, or energy meridians, form tree-like structures. A post-mortem examination will not reveal the chakras or the nadis. But that does not mean they do not exist. You need to refine your tool that you use to look. You must first learn to quiet your own mind. Only then you will observe these things first within yourself. In electrical theory, the less resistance in a wire, the more easily it can carry energy. When you cultivate equanimity through meditation, it creates a state of non-resistance in your body. Prana, or chi, or inner energy, is simply your inner aliveness what you feel when you bring your consciousness within the body. The subtle wires within your body that carry prana, the nadis, become able to move more and more pranic energy through the chakras. Your wiring becomes stronger as you use it, as you allow energy to flow. Wherever consciousness is placed, chi or energy will begin to flow and physical connections blossom. Within the brain and nervous system, physical wiring patterns become established by repetition. By continually placing your attention within and lowering resistance to the sensations you are experiencing, you increase your energetic capacity. In Taoism, the yin-yang symbol represents the interpenetration of the spiral forces of nature. The yin-yang is not two and not one. The ancient concept of the hara is represented by a yin-yang, or spiral swirl. It is the power center located in the belly below the navel. Hara means literally sea or ocean of energy. In China, the hara is called the Lower Dantian. In many forms of Asian martial arts, the warrior with strong hara is said to be unstoppable. In the samurai tradition, one form of ritual suicide, or seppuku, was hara kiri, was often mispronounced as hari kiri. It means to impale one's hara thereby cutting off one's chi, or energy channel. Moving from this center creates the grounded, graceful movement that you see not only in martial arts, but in great golfers, belly dancers, and Sufi whirling dervishes. It is the cultivation of single-pointed, disciplined consciousness that is the essence of Hara, the stillness in the eye of the hurricane. It is the gut instinct in connection to one's energy source. A person with good hara is connected to the earth and to the intuitive wisdom that connects all beings. To think with your belly, hara dekanganese, is to tap into your inner wisdom The ancient Australian Aborigines concentrated on the same area 
just below the navel, where the cord of the great rainbow serpent lay coiled. Again, a representation of the evolutionary energy in humankind. It is no accident that it is in the Hara where new life begins. The enteric nervous system, sometimes referred to as the gut brain, is capable of maintaining a complex matrix of connections similar to the brain in the head with its own neurons and neurotransmitters. It can act autonomously, that is, with its own intelligence. You could say that the gut brain is a fractal version of the head brain, or perhaps the head brain is a fractal version of the gut brain. A healthy bear has strong hara. When a bear knows where to forage for herbs, it follows the movement of chi through its senses centered in the hara or belly. This is the bear's connection to the dream lodge, the place in native traditions where all knowledge comes from, to the spiral of life. But how did ancient peoples know about the spiral, if modern science is just now starting to recognize its significance? Ask the bees, for they have not forgotten how to love. Bees have a special connection to the source as part of a symbiotic system, helping beauty and diversity to flourish. They are a bridge between the macrocosm and the microcosm. There is one heart that connects all, a hive mind, if you will. Like an open brain, the hive sends out its dreams into the world to be manifested. In nature, many creatures know how to act in unison, to move with one spirit, one direction. but not all benefit the other species around them. For example, the locust will devour everything in its path. A locust has no choice but to act like a locust. It will never make honey or pollinate plants the way a bee does. A locust behavior is rigid, but a human is unique in that we can act like a bee or we can act like a locust. We are free to change and manipulate the patterns of how we interact with the world. We can exist symbiotically or as a parasite. Today, humans try to understand the spiral with the rational mind. But it was never thinking that connected us to the spiral of life. We have always been connected. Thinking has been what keeps us in the illusion of separateness within our own identities. Thinking is the creation of separateness, the experience of limitation. The more we align with thought, the more removed we become from the source. 
Ancient cultures that were less thought-oriented align themselves with the spiral in a more direct and personal way than we do today. In ancient India, Kundalini is a representation of one's inner energy, which moves in snake-like or helix-like pattern up the spine. In the ancient yogic traditions of India, the inner worlds of people at that time were comparable to those of Hara-centered cultures. To balance the power of the spiral with the stillness of your witnessing consciousness is to align with your full evolutionary potential, to blossom into the unique multifaceted being you were designed to be. Ida, the feminine or moon channel, is connected to the right brain, and Pingala, the masculine or sun channel, connected to the left brain. When these two channels are in balance, energy flows up a third channel, Sushumna, along the center of the spine, energizing the chakras and unlocking one's full evolutionary potential. The word chakra is an ancient Sanskrit word meaning energy wheel. Kundalini is nothing less than the primordial spiral that dances your human life into existence. It is a different order of energy than we normally understand, like a bridge from gross matter to the most subtle energies. You are that bridge. Kundalini is not energy that can be forced by will, effort, and friction. It is analogous to growing a flower. All we can do as good gardeners is prepare the soil in proper conditions and let nature take its course. If you force a flower to open prematurely, you will destroy it. It grows with its own intelligence, with its own self-organizing direction. The egoic mind which fixates on the outer world is what keeps you from experiencing your true inner vibratory nature. When consciousness is turned within, it becomes like the sun's rays and the lotus within begins to grow. As Kundalini awakens within oneself, one begins to see the signature of the spiral in all things, in all patterns within and without. This spiral is the link between our inner worlds and our outer worlds. Prior to the dawn of Western civilization in written language, science and spirituality were not two separate things. In the teachings of the great ancient traditions, the outer search for knowledge and certainty was balanced by an inner feeling of impermanence and intuitive understanding of the spiral of change. As scientific thinking became more dominant and information multiplied, fragmentation began to occur within our knowledge systems. Increased specialization meant that fewer people were capable of seeing the big picture, of feeling and intuiting the aesthetic of the system as a whole. No one was asking, is all this thinking good for us? The ancient knowledge is here in our midst hidden in plain view, but we are too preoccupied with our thoughts to recognize it. This forgotten wisdom is the way to restore the balance between the inner and the outer, yin and yang, between the spiral of change and the stillness at our core.
In Greek legend, Asclepius was the son of Apollo and the god of healing. His wisdom and skills at healing were unsurpassed, and he is said to have discovered the secret of life and death itself. In ancient Greece, the Asclepian healing temples recognized the power of the primordial spiral, which is symbolized by the rod of Asclepius. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, whose oath still forms the moral code of the medical profession, was said to have received his training at an Asclepian temple. To this day, this symbol of our evolutionary energy remains as the logo for the American Medical Association and other medical organizations worldwide. In Egyptian iconography, the snake and bird represent the duality or polarity of human nature. The snake, the downward direction, is the manifested spiral, the evolutionary energy of the world. The bird is the upward direction, the upward current oriented towards the sun, or awakened single-pointed consciousness, the emptiness of Akasha. Pharaohs and gods are depicted with awakened energy, whereby the kundalini snake moves up the spine and pierces Ajna Chakra between the eyes. This is referred to as the Eye of Horus. In the Hindu tradition, the Bindi is also representative of the third eye, the divine connection to spirit. King Tutankhamun's mask is a classic example showing both the snake and bird motifs. The Mayan and Aztec traditions combine the serpent and bird motif into one god, Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan. The winged serpent god represents the awakened evolutionary consciousness or awakened Kundalini. The person who awakens Quetzalcoatl within themselves is a living manifestation of the divine. It is said that Quetzalcoatl, or serpent energy, shall return at the end of time. The snake and bird symbols can be found within Christianity as well. Their true meaning may be more deeply encrypted, but the meaning is the same as in other ancient traditions. In Christianity, the bird or dove, often seen above Christ's head, represents Holy Spirit, or Kundalini Shakti, as it rises to the sixth chakra and beyond. The Christian mystics called Kundalini by another name, Holy Spirit. In John 3.12, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus and Moses awaken their Kundalini energy, bringing awakened consciousness to the unconscious reptilian forces that drive human craving. Jesus was said to have spent 40 days and nights in the desert, during which time he was tempted by Satan. Similarly, the Buddha was tempted by Mara as he sat to reach enlightenment under the Bodhi tree or wisdom tree. Both Christ and Buddha had to turn away from the lure of sensory pleasures and worldly grasping. In each story, the demon is the personification of one's own attachments. Uh, 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 
If we read the Adam and Eve story in the light of the Vedic and Egyptian traditions, we find that the serpent guarding the tree of life is Kundalini. The apple represents the lure and temptation of the external sensory world, distracting us from the knowledge of the inner world, the tree of knowledge within. The tree is simply the network of navies or energy meridians within ourselves, which literally form tree-like structures throughout the body. In our egoic quest for external gratification, we have cut ourselves off from the knowledge of the inner world, our connection to Akasha and the wisdom source. Many of the world's historical myths about dragons can be read as metaphors for the inner energies of the cultures in which they are embedded. In China, the dragon is still a sacred symbol representing happiness. Like the Egyptian pharaohs, ancient Chinese emperors who had awakened their evolutionary energies were represented by the winged snake or dragon. The royal totem of the Jade Emperor, or Celestial Emperor, shows a balance similar to Ida and Pengala. The yin and yang of Taoism, awakening the pineal center, or what in Taoism is called the Upper Dantian. Nature is full of different light detection and assimilation mechanisms. For example, a sea urchin can actually see with its spiky body, which acts as one big eye. Urchins detect light striking their spines and compare the beam's intensities to get a sense of their surroundings. Green iguanas and other reptiles have a parietal eye or pineal gland on top of their heads, which they use to detect predators from above. The human pineal gland is a small endocrine gland that helps to regulate waking and sleeping patterns. Even though it is buried deep inside the head, the pineal gland is sensitive to light. The philosopher Descartes recognized that the pineal gland area, or third eye, was the interface between consciousness and matter. Almost everything is symmetrical in the human body. Two eyes, two ears, two nostrils. Even the brain has two sides. But there is one area of the brain that is not mirrored. This is the pineal gland area and the energetic center that surrounds it. On a physical level, unique molecules are formed naturally by the pineal gland such as DMT. DMT also forms naturally at the moment of birth and moment of death, literally acting as a unique bridge between the world of the living and the dead. DMT is produced naturally during states of deep meditation and samadhi, or through entheogenic means. For example, ayahuasca is used in the shamanic traditions of South America to remove the veil between the inner and outer worlds. The word pineal itself has the same root as pine cone, because the pineal gland exhibits a similar spiral phyllotaxis pattern. This pattern, also known as the flower of life pattern, is common in ancient artwork depicting enlightened or awakened beings. When the pine cone image is seen in sacred artwork, it represents the awakened third eye, single pointed consciousness, directing the flow of evolutionary energy. The pine cone represents the flowering of the higher chakras, which are activated as Sushumna 
rises to the Ajna Chakra and beyond. In Greek mythology, the worshippers of Dionysus carried a thyrsus, or giant staff, wrapped with spiraling vines topped with a pine cone, again representing Dionysian energy, or Kundalini Shakti, as it travels up the spine to the pineal body at the sixth chakra. In the heart of the Vatican, you might expect a giant sculpture of Jesus or Mary, but instead we find a giant pine cone statue, indicating that in Christian history, there may have been knowledge of the chakras in Kundalini, but for whatever reason, it was kept from the masses. The official church explanation is that the pine cone is a symbol of regeneration and represents new life in Christ. The 13th century philosopher and mystic, Meister Eckhart said, the eye with which I see God and the eye with which God sees me is one and the same. In the King James Bible, Jesus said, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. The Buddha said, the body is an eye. In a state of samadhi, one is both the seer and the seen. We are the universe aware of itself. When Kundalini is activated, it stimulates the sixth chakra and pineal center, and this area starts to regain some of its evolutionary functions. Darkness meditation has been used for thousands of years as a way to activate the sixth chakra in the area of the pineal gland. Activation of this center allows a person to be able to see their inner light. Whether it is the proverbial yogi or shaman retreating deep into a cave, or Taoist or Mayan initiate, or a Tibetan monk, all traditions incorporate a period of time during which one goes into the darkness. The pineal gland is the gateway to being able to experience one subtle energy directly. The philosopher Nietzsche said, if you stare into the abyss long enough, eventually you find the abyss stares back at you. Dolmens, or ancient portal tombs, are among the oldest remaining structures on Earth. Most date to the Neolithic period of 3000 to 4000 BC, and some in Western Europe are 7000 years old. The dolmen was used to enter into perpetual meditation as a way for a human to bridge the inner and outer worlds. As one continues to meditate in total darkness, eventually one begins to observe inner energy or light as the third eye becomes active. The circadian rhythms, which are governed by the sun and moon channels, no longer control the functions of the body, and a new rhythm is established. The seventh chakra for thousands of years has been represented by the Om symbol, a symbol which is constructed by Sanskrit signs representing the elements. When Kundalini rises beyond the sixth chakra, it begins to create an energy halo. Halos appear consistently in the religious paintings of different traditions in all different parts of the world.
The halo, or the depiction of an energy signature around an awakened being, is common to virtually all religions in all parts of the world. The evolutionary process of awakening the chakras is not the property of one group or one religion. It is the birthright of every human being on the planet. The crown chakra is the connection to the divine, that which is beyond duality, beyond name and form. Akhenaten was a pharaoh whose wife was Nefertiti. He is referred to as the son of the sun. He rediscovered Aten, or the word of God within himself uniting kundalini and consciousness. In Egyptian iconography, once again the awakened consciousness is represented by the solar disk, seen above the heads of gods or awakened beings. In the Hindu and yogic traditions, this halo is called Sahasrara, the thousand petal lotus. The Buddha is associated with the symbol of the lotus. The phyllotaxis pattern is the same pattern as can be found in a blooming lotus. It is the flower of life pattern, the seed of life, it is the fundamental pattern into which all forms fit. It is the very shape of space itself, or a quality inherent to Akasha. At one time in history, the flower of life symbol was prevalent all over Earth. The flower of life is found guarded by lions at the entrance of the most holy places in China and other parts of Asia. The 64 hexagrams of the I Ching often surround a yin-yang symbol, which is yet another way of representing the flower of life. Within the flower of life is the geometric basis for all of the platonic solids essentially every form that can exist. The ancient flower of life begins with the geometry of the Star of David, or upward and downward facing triangles. Or in 3D, these would be tetrahedral structures. This symbol is a yantra, a sort of program that exists within the universe, the machine that is generating our fractal world. Yantras have been used as tools for awakening consciousness for thousands of years. The visual form of the yantra is an external representation of an inner process of spiritual unfolding. It is the hidden music of the universe made visible, comprised of intersecting geometrical forms and interference patterns. Each chakra is a lotus, a yantra, a psychophysiological center through which the world can be experienced. A traditional yantra, such as can be found in the Tibetan tradition, is invested with rich layers of meaning, sometimes incorporating a complete cosmology and worldview. 
The Yantra is a constantly evolving pattern which works through the power of repetition or iteration of a cycle. The power of the Yantra is all but lost in today's world because we seek meaning only in the external form and we do not connect it to our inner energies through intention. There is a good reason why priests, monks and yogis traditionally have been celibate. Today all but a tiny few know why they are practicing celibacy, because the true purpose has become lost. Quite simply, if your energy is going into producing more sperm or eggs, as the case may be, then there is not as much to fuel the rising of Kundalini, which activates the higher chakras. Kundalini is life energy, which is also sexual energy. When awareness becomes less focused on animal urges and is put into the objects reflective of the higher chakras, that energy flows up the spine and to those chakras. Many of the tantric practices teach how to master sexual energy so that it can be used for higher spiritual evolution. Your state of consciousness creates the right conditions for your energy to be able to grow. Entering a state of consciousness takes no time. As Eckhart Tolle says, awareness and presence always happen in the now. If you are trying to make something happen, then you are creating resistance to what is. It is the removing of all resistance that allows evolutionary energy to unfold. In the ancient yogic tradition, yoga postures were used to prepare the body for meditation. Hatha yoga was never intended solely as an exercise regime, but as a way to link one's inner and outer worlds. The Sanskrit word Hatha means sun, ha, and moon, tha. In the original Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, the purpose of the eight limbs of yoga are the same as the Buddha's eightfold path to liberate one from suffering. When the polarities of the dual world are in balance, a third thing is born. We find the mysterious golden key that unlocks the evolutionary forces of nature. This synthesis of the sun and moon channels is our evolutionary energy. Because humans are now identified almost exclusively with their thoughts and the outer world, it is a rare individual that achieves a balance of the inner and outer forces which allow Kundalini to awaken naturally. For those identified only with the illusion, Kundalini will always remain a metaphor, an idea rather than a direct experience of one's energy and consciousness. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We live our lives pursuing happiness out there, as if it is a commodity. We have become slaves to our own desires and craving. Happiness is not something that can be pursued or purchased like a cheap suit. This is Maya, illusion, the endless play of form. In the Buddhist tradition, samsara, or the endless cycle of suffering, 
is perpetuated by the craving of pleasure and aversion to pain. Freud referred to this as the pleasure principle. Everything we do is an attempt to create pleasure, to gain something that we want, or to push away something undesirable that we don't want. Even a simple organism like the paramecium does this. It is called response to stimulus. Unlike a paramecium, humans have more choice. We are free to think, and that is the heart of the problem. It is the thinking about what we want that has gotten out of control. society is that we seek to understand the world not in terms of archaic inner consciousness but by quantifying and qualifying what we perceive to be the external world by using scientific means and thought thinking has only led to more thinking and more questions we seek to know the innermost forces which create the world and guide its course but we conceive of this essence as outside of ourselves, not as a living thing intrinsic to our own nature. It was the famous psychiatrist Carl Jung who said, one who looks outside dreams, one who looks inside awakes. It is not wrong to desire to be awake, to be happy. What is wrong is to look for happiness outside when it can only be found inside. August 4, 2010, at the Techonomy Conference in Lake Tahoe, California, Eric Schmidt, CEO of Google, mentioned an astounding statistic. Every two days now, we create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up until 2003, according to Schmidt. That's something like five exabytes of data. Never in human history has there been so much thinking, and never has there been so much turmoil on the planet. Could it be that every time we think of a solution to one problem, we create two more problems? What good is all this thinking if it doesn't lead to greater happiness? Are we happier, more equanimous, more joyful as a result of all this thinking? Or does it isolate us, disconnect us from a deeper and more meaningful experience of life? Thinking, acting and doing must be brought into balance with being. After all, we are human beings, not human doings. We want change, and we want stability at the same time. Our hearts have become disconnected from the spiral of life, the law of change, as our thinking minds drive us toward stability, security, and pacification of the senses. With a morbid fascination, we watch killings, tsunamis, earthquakes, and wars. We constantly try to occupy our mind, fill it with information. TV shows streaming from every conceivable device, games and puzzles, text messaging, and every possible trivial thing. We let ourselves become mesmerized with the endless stream of new images, new information, 
new ways to tantalize and pacify the senses. At times of quiet inner reflection, our hearts may tell us that there is more to life than our present reality, that we live in a world of hungry ghosts, endlessly craving and never satisfied. We have created a maelstrom of data flying around the planet to facilitate more thinking, more ideas about how to fix the world, to fix the problems that only exist because the mind has created them. Thinking has created the whole big mess that we are in right now. We wage wars against diseases, enemies, and problems. The paradox is that whatever you resist persists. The more you resist something, the stronger it gets. Like exercising a muscle, you are actually strengthening the very thing you want to rid yourself of. So then, what is the alternative to thinking? What other mechanism can humans use to exist on this planet? While Western culture in recent centuries has focused on exploring the physical by using thought and analysis, other ancient cultures have developed equally sophisticated technologies for exploring inner space. It is the loss of the connection to our inner worlds that has created imbalance on our planet. The ancient tenet, Know Thyself, has been replaced with a desire to know and experience the outer world of form. Answering the question, who am I, is not simply a matter of describing what is on your business card. In Buddhism, you are not the content of your consciousness. You are not merely a collection of thoughts or ideas, because behind the thoughts is the one who is witnessing the thoughts. The imperative know thyself is a Zen koan, an unanswerable riddle. Eventually the mind will become exhausted in trying to find an answer, like a dog chasing its tail. It is only the ego identity that wants to find an answer, a purpose. The truth of who you are does not need an answer, because all questions are created by the egoic mind. You are not your mind. The truth lies not in more answers, but in less questions. As Joseph Campbell said, I don't believe people are looking for the meaning of life as much as they are looking for the experience of being alive. When the Buddha was asked, what are you? He said simply, I am awake. What does this mean to be awake? The Buddha does not say exactly because the flowering of each individual life is different. But he does say one thing. It is the end of suffering. Every major religious tradition has a name for the state of being awake. Heaven, Nirvana, or Moksha. A quiet mind is all you need to realize the nature of the stream. All else will happen once your mind is quiet. In that stillness, inner energies wake up and work without effort on your part. As the Taoists say, Qi follows consciousness. 
By being still, one begins to hear the wisdom of the plants and animals, the quiet whispers and dreams, and one learns the subtle mechanism by which those dreams come into material form. In the Tao Te Ching, this kind of living is called Wei Wu Wei. Doing, not doing. The Buddha spoke of the middle way as the path that leads to enlightenment. Aristotle described the golden mean, the middle between two extremes as the path of beauty. Not too much effort, but not too little either. Yin and yang in perfect balance. Vedanta's notion of maya or illusion is that we do not experience the environment itself, but rather a projection of it, created by thoughts. Of course, your thoughts let you experience the vibratory world in a certain way. But our inner equanimity need not be contingent on external happenings. The belief in an external world, independent of the perceiving subject, is fundamental to science. But our senses only give us indirect information. Our notions about this mind-made physical world are always filtered through the senses, and therefore always incomplete. There is one field of vibration underlying all of the senses. People with a condition called synesthesia sometimes experience this vibratory field in different ways. Synesthetes can see sounds as colors or shapes, or associate qualities of one sense with another. Synesthesia refers to a synthesis or intermingling of the senses. The chakras in the senses are like a prism, filtering a continuum of vibration. All things in the universe are vibrating, but at different rates and frequencies. The Eye of Horus is made up of six symbols, each representing the senses. Like the ancient Vedic system, thought is considered to be a sense. Thoughts are received simultaneously as sensations are experienced on the body. They arise from the same vibratory source. Thinking is simply a tool, one of six senses but we have elevated it to such a high status that we identify ourselves with our thoughts. The fact that we do not recognize thinking as one of the six senses is very significant. We are so immersed in thought that trying to explain thought as a sense is like telling a fish about water. Water, what water? In the Upanishads, it is said, not that which the eye can see, but that whereby the eye can see. Know that to be Brahman, the eternal, and not what people here adore. Not that which the ear can hear, but that whereby the ear can hear. Know that to be Brahman, the eternal, and not what people here adore. Not that which speech can illuminate, but that by which speech can be illuminated. Know that to be Brahman the Eternal, and not what people here adore. Not that which the mind can think, but that whereby the mind can think. Know that to be Brahman the Eternal, and not what people here adore.
In the last decade, great advances have taken place in the area of brain research. Scientists have discovered neuroplasticity, a term which conveys the idea that the physical wiring of the brain changes according to the thoughts moving through it. As Canadian psychologist Donald Hebb put it, neurons that fire together, wire together. Neurons wire together most when a person is in a state of sustained attention. What this means is that it is possible to direct your own subjective experience of reality. Literally, if your thoughts are ones of fear, worry, anxiety, and negativity, then you grow the wiring for more of those thoughts to flourish. If you direct your thoughts to be ones of love, compassion, gratitude, and joy, you create the wiring for repeating those experiences. But how do we do that if we are surrounded by violence and suffering? Isn't this some kind of delusion or wishful thinking? Neuroplasticity is not the same as the New Age notion that you create your reality by positive thinking. It is actually the same thing that the Buddha taught 2,500 years ago. Vipassana meditation or insight meditation could be described as self-directed neuroplasticity. You accept your reality exactly as it is, as it actually is, but you experience it at the root level of sensation, at the vibratory or energetic level, without the prejudice or influence of thought, through sustained attention at the root level of consciousness. The wiring for an entirely different perception of reality is created. We have got it backwards most of the time. We constantly let ideas about the outer world shape our neural networks. But our inner equanimity need not be contingent on external happenings. Circumstances don't matter. Only my state of consciousness matters. Meditation in Sanskrit means to be free of measurement, free of all comparison, to be free of all becoming. You are not trying to become something else. You are okay with what is. The way to rise above the suffering of the physical realm is to totally embrace it, to say yes to it, so it becomes something within you, rather than you being something within it. How does one live in such a way that consciousness is no longer in conflict with its content? How does one empty the heart of petty ambitions? There must be a total revolution in consciousness, a radical shift in orientation from the outer world to the inner. It is not a revolution brought about by will or effort alone, but also by surrender, acceptance of reality as it is. The image of Christ's open heart powerfully conveys the idea that one must open to all pain. One must accept all if one is to remain open to the evolutionary source. This doesn't mean you become a masochist. You don't look for pain. But when pain comes, which it inevitably does, you simply accept reality as it is, instead of craving some other reality. The Hawaiians have long believed that it is through the heart that we learn truth. The heart has its own intelligence, as distinctly as the brain does. The Egyptians believed that the heart, not the brain, was the source of human wisdom. The heart was considered the center of the soul and the personality. It was through the heart that the divine spoke, giving ancient Egyptians knowledge of their true path. 
This papyrus depicts the weighing of the heart. It was considered a good thing to go into the afterlife with a light heart. It meant that you had lived well. One universal or archetypal stage that people experience in the process of awakening the heart center is the experience of one's own energy as the energy of the universe. When you allow yourself to feel this love, to be this love, when you connect your inner world with the outer world, then all is one. How does one experience the music of the spheres? How does a heart open? Sri Ramana Maharshi said, God dwells in you as you and you don't have to do anything to be God-realized or self-realized. It is already your true and natural state. Just drop all seeking, turn your attention inward, and sacrifice your mind to the one self, radiating in the heart of your very being. For this to be your own presently lived experience, self-inquiry is the one direct and immediate way When you meditate and observe sensations within your inner aliveness, you are actually observing change. This force of change is the arising and passing away as energy changes form. The degree to which a person has evolved or become enlightened is the degree to which one has gained the ability to adapt to each moment or to transmute the constantly changing human stream of circumstances pain and pleasure into bliss. Leo Tolstoy, author of War and Peace, said, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing him or herself. Darwin said the most important characteristic for the survival of a species is not strength or intelligence, but adaptability to change. One must become adept at adapting. This is the Buddhist teaching of the Nietzsche. Everything is arising and passing away, changing, constantly changing. Suffering exists only because we become attached to a particular form. When you connect to the witnessing part of yourself with the understanding of a Nietzsche, bliss arises in the heart. Saints, sages, and yogis throughout history unanimously describe one sacred union that occurs in the heart, whether it is the writings of St. John of the Cross, Rumi's poetry, or the tantric teachings of India. All of these different teachings try to express the subtle mystery of the heart. In the heart is the union of Shiva and Shakti, masculine penetration into the spiral of life, and feminine surrender to change. Witnessing and unconditional acceptance of all that is. 
In order to open your heart, you must open yourself to change. To live in the seemingly solid world, dance with it, engage with it, live fully, love fully, but yet know that it is impermanent and that ultimately all forms dissolve and change. Bliss is the energy that responds to stillness. It comes from emptying consciousness of all content. The content of this bliss energy born of stillness is consciousness, a new consciousness of the heart, a consciousness that is connected to all that is.